Welcome to Building Passive House, Optimizing Costs and Benefits, where we'll be hearing about how one local team is building certified passive house homes. We have a very, very large registration here again tonight. We already have over 150 people live on this call. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, CGBG is a Boulder County-based nonprofit organization, the Colorado Green Building Guild, founded in 2004, and we work to bring together builders, designers, product manufacturers, engineers, real estate professionals, really anybody involved in the built environment that are committed to or interested in green building. We are here to provide resources, education, and networking opportunities to our members and provide leadership within our community. Although we are a small organization run by volunteers. It has been amazing to see the amount we've been able to accomplish over these last few months uh, as we've dedicated this year to assisting where we can in the recovering, recovery and rebuilding of communities impacted by the Marshall Fire. You may have been part of our previous events, um, met us at the Expo, and you'll see us in the future as we work behind the scenes with Boulder County to bring more resources to both professionals and homeowners. With that, I'd like to thank our sponsors. Our sponsors help make all of this work happen. Our sustaining sponsors include Louisville's own Alpen High Performance Products, who have been a national leader in window technology as well. Um, they're joined by 475, another sustaining sponsor, High Performance Building Supply, where we get all of our fun membranes and airtight details and tapes. Our supporting sponsors are Hammerwell, Caddis Collaborative, Living Craft, Boulder County, Cottonwood Custom Builders, and Floor Systems. However you prefer to stay tuned, this is where you'll find us. Lastly, before we begin, we'd like to thank AIA Colorado for making this presentation eligible for continuing education credits. For those who are interested, we'll be dropping a link later in the chat or following up with a link in a follow-up email after this presentation to all attendees. Um, and thank you, AIA Colorado, for supporting us. Hey, guys, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for everything and having us here tonight. Absolutely. Do you want to just introduce yourself, give everybody joining a, a little brief introduction and let them know who you are, and then we'll, we'll let you take over. Okay, sure. So I'm Brian, and um, this is Stephen here. <laughs> And uh, we're going to be doing a pre-recorded um, presentation tonight. Uh, we're going to do uh, the first video session um, from Megan, and then we're going to take a break, and it'll break to the YouTube video that it was on the CGBG webpage that maybe some of you have seen, but if not all of you, uh, it's kind of a brief video tour of uh, Stephen's house, which was recently completed in Louisville. Um, we thought it was timely um, because it... Um, with current construction prices and um, current market conditions, a uh, past house project in Louisville. So we thought it was a good good starting place for this conversation. And then we'll come back to the Vimeo um, re pre-recorded video to finish the technical part of the presentation and then take questions at the end. So bear with us with any technical um, snafus as we kind of move from one software to the next. Perfect. Well, we're Transitioning, just a reminder, you can ask your questions during this presentation in the chat or Q&A. Um, Michael and Shannon are organizing questions, and I'll be moderating quest the Q&A at the end of this presentation. So thanks so much, guys, and I'll hand it off to you. Hi, everyone. I'm Megan Monroe. I work at Fuentes Design. Although I'm not an architect, I studied environmental engineering. Um, at School of Mines before joining Fuentes Design about 12 years ago now. Um, I just wanted to touch on real quickly why we're doing this presentation and um, say that first off, unfortunately, we're not able to take on any clients until 2024. Um, we are trying to save some, keep some flexibility in our schedule to help if a larger effort um, comes up and an opportunity to help more people than just individual clients. Um, but unfortunately we can't take clients on until 2024. 
But this is really what we're passionate about. Um, Brian founded Fuentes Design over 20 years ago now um, with the intention to focus on buildings that had a positive impact. And we've done everything from straw bale, off-grid, uh, zero energy homes. But I believe it was in 2010, Brian was first certified through the Passive House Institute in Darmstadt, Germany as a Passive House uh, consultant. And um, since that time, we've really just focused on building all electric high performance homes throughout the Boulder area. So we have over 10 years focusing purely on all electric homes. And um, our hope is just to share what we've learned um, and our experience in that. Um, but then also, for those of you who don't know us, um, Brian, I'm also married to Brian, and we lived in downtown Marshall. Uh, it was a high performance, an all electric high performance home we built for ourselves. Uh, we drove electrically for free off the solar panels. Um, when the power went out, our house stayed warm. And, you know, I think what I'm here to share is that, like many of you, I mean, it was more than a high performance home to us. It was our home. It was where Brian and I got married, and it's where we were raising our children. And like many of you here, it's it's gone. And yeah, that night of the fire, you know, really, um, after learning we lost everything, we were staying at a friend's house, and Brian went to the store to get some things for us. And he came home with bananas and toothbrushes, because where do you even begin? And I think that's the biggest question we keep getting when people call us is where do we even begin? And so our intent with this is really to just help with spread the knowledge that we do have um, and help in any way possible. So with that, we have a quick video and then uh, Brian and Stephen will dig into the details. here in Louisville, Colorado, and this is the home of um, Stephen Ruiz and Tina, his wife, and they built this house um, off an existing foundation, um, but it was just a regular house in Louisville. It represents, in my mind, best practices and what I'm going to build back for my family after the fire as well. And with the devastation and how many homes have been lost in our area, it's a, it's a real opportunity to, uh, to build back in a more environmentally responsible way. It's a passive house, and that means it's super insulated. It's oriented toward the sun to have the majority of heating provided by the windows. The conditions which you know caused this devastation is definitely contributed from climate change, and the houses and the buildings that we use are a, a large contributing uh, factor to that. Passive house, the reason it has value is carbon neutrality cost effectively. So they were looking at a way to essentially tunnel under the cost barrier by making the building so efficient that you would net major mechanical savings. We try to reduce the energy required to heat and cool the building by doing a super insulated envelope and air sealing. And so that was the breakthrough with Passive House that I wasn't seeing here and the work we were doing because we were doing pretty good, but we weren't doing Passive House level. You have to get to a certain point where the mechanical system becomes cheaper and then you get the savings that Passive House nets. And if you don't do that, you, you, it does cost more. And so that's, I think, some of the problem with the reaction right now to the Home Building Association saying, hey, if we adopt these higher and higher codes, the costs are going up. But that's because they're not getting the passive house levels. And that's why, and this is a simplified diagram of what I think gets most people excited at the beginning is that as you make the house more energy efficient, your costs go up. Where I was practicing between 2002 and 2009 was in this range where I was saying, hey, I'm trying to make a more efficient house. But we weren't getting to this point here where you get a very simple, very inexpensive mechanical system and suddenly the cost drops back down to here. So now you're at the same cost as a regular almost code built house. And this is for all markets. This is you know the affordable market. So Habitat for Humanity can build a passive house and they've proven they can do this. We're building passive houses for the same price point as other local builders are building uh, conventional code minimum construction. Once you've done a passive house, there's no going back. You know, once you've lived in one of these things, you don't want to live in a conventional building because it's just so much more comfortable. You've got filtered indoor air that is uh, changed out every three to four hours and indoor comfort. 
You don't get drafts. You don't get cold radiating from the windows. Well, there's no cold spots. The glazing um, is triple glazing. It's, it's super warm on a cold day. Um, and if it's shaded properly, it's also going to be really um, cool on a hot day outside. These are R10 windows. For comparison, standard 2x4 constructed wall uh, is R13. The windows are thicker and the walls are thicker. <laughs> so when you put all that together, um, you get more comfort. And what you do is you rapidly reduce the amount of heat that it takes to heat the building. So the furnace isn't kicking on and off all the time. Low to no utility bills, you know, with energy costs only going up, that's gonna be more and more savings. If the power goes out, my pipes won't freeze. If all the power goes out and my neighbors are cold, they're gonna to come to my house because it's actually, you know, warm and comfortable, even though there's no power. Everything is so well insulated and uh, air sealed. Um, the house can maintain uh, a warm temperature uh, through the winter, even without the heat running. What we found to be the simplest and most cost-effective way is a double stud wall. Normal two by four wall on the outside, then we do a second two by four wall interior of that with a 16 inch cavity, which we then fill with cellulose insulation, which is basically a recycled newspaper. It's cheaper and more environmentally friendly than trying to do spray foam insulation. Doing the double stud wall, which is, you know, conventional construction because you got a conventional two by four wall. You can use any siding or exterior finish that you like. The other big piece of the uh, envelope is the air sealing. And that is a detail that just takes attention. Basically what we do is we tape all the seams on the plywood and that also needs to then get taped up over the roof and it also needs to get taped down to the foundation. So here we are in the uh, upstairs mechanical room where we have the ventilation system. This can be controlled with an app on your phone and you can also see here the outdoor air is 14 degrees, yet the supply air is coming in at 60 degrees. A lot of people hear the term ERV, it stands for energy recovering ventilator. So basically the exhaust air is run across the incoming air so that it transfers 90 to 95% of that heat to the incoming air. It's something that people want because it provides fresh filtered outside air constantly to the house. You know, with environmental conditions changing, the air pollution, the fires in the West becoming a problem, it's an opportunity to, you know, basically create a better indoor air quality. It's an all-electric house, so the cook cooktop is induction and all the other appliances are electric as well. And that allows us to offset the energy use uh, with the photovoltaic system. It also adds to the uh, positive indoor air quality because one of the uh, number one indoor air pollutants is uh, from gas appliances. So as you can see, everything looks like your normal furnace. It's an all electric. The mechanical systems that we use for geothermal, you drill into the ground and you run piping that pulls heat out of the ground or puts heat into the ground. Those pipes then run back to a conventional forced air system. So you can tie that into the water heater uh, as well. And when you are cooling the building in the summer, you're exhausting heat. Um, and so that heat then goes into the water tanks and you basically get free uh, water heating. When you reshuffle your priorities, that can be a little scary. Maybe you have to let some of those things go and those roof corners that you were gonna spend a bunch of money detailing, now you're gonna spend that money on nicer windows. But I think once people see the finished product or they live in the finished product, they would gladly trade those things because they realize, hey, you know, what's more important to me is being comfortable. Not only will it help the environment um, around us, but it'll also provide residents in the local area a more comfortable home to live in. So today we are here to talk about optimizing for passive house design. Um, and ultimately we're going to have to talk about certification of some sort to get the rebate. Um, and that's really why we're showing this particular slide and why this is such a big deal for everyone involved because uh, Excel is offering a rebate of um, for energy efficiency standards of all types, but up to $37,500 for passive house. And so our goal, um, in doing this presentation really is because um, we can't take on any new work, but we wanted to share our experience so that other design professionals, builders, architects, uh, consultants could, could help as many people as possible achieve this rebate, um, which is a historic opportunity for everyone. So um, please talk to the pros at the right time. I know this is still in the works, but uh, there's the Passive House Institute in Germany. 
There is also uh, FIAS, which is the U.S. organization. These are two different standards, uh, two different certification mechanisms, but we're not going to talk about today. Um, but just so you're aware, also uh, emu.systems is our uh, excellent uh, trainer and certifier based in Arvada, Colorado. So they're local. Um, they're very involved in the local community here in training professionals. And so um, they've done a lot for the community, but they're going to be a huge resource in this, as well as the Colorado Green Building Guild as a resource and uh, the Boulder County Energy Smart uh, website and everything that uh, uh, the uh, Oscar office is doing as well. So please stay in touch as we as we move forward and uh, stay tuned for Excel to release more information on on how we're going to do this. But today we're just going to focus on the real nuts and bolts of um, how we've done this the last 10 years and to try to make it easier for you to achieve this certification. So um, a big topic uh, today is, is building electrification and it has a lot of benefits both for uh, the utility, for climate change and for the homeowner. Um, the, the, re the real key to this slide is, is and this is based on a uh, passive house slide that's typically shown of the German building stock that uh, is older, but the slide looks very similar for uh, U.S. homes that were built, you know, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and even into the 80s and 90s, unfortunately, um, but very inefficient. And you have a massive demand for space heating and cooling, uh, which is what you see on the far left side of the slide. And then as you move towards the passive house methodology, the really key thing here to understand is that essentially the, the heating and cooling loads are going away, which is why it's called passive house. It doesn't doesn't really need a heating system except for in extreme uh, hot periods or extreme cold periods. It's it, the heating system is essentially a backup, and your heat from the, your computers and the lights and you cooking and moving around and doing uh, you know your kids jumping up around and, and using lots of energy. That's what's really heating your house, and and so your heating and cooling loads, if you see on the far uh, right side of this slide essentially gets down to the same amount of energy that you're using for your plug loads, your lighting, and your water heating uh, on an annual basis. So essentially it's going away and that's why passive house is so important for building electrification. And so the benefit to you um, just as a consumer is that now it makes it really easy um, and we'll talk about this as we go through the presentation uh, to power your house with solar on your roof because that system can be pretty modestly sized. It can also help power your electric car. Um, and in a, in a power outage, you can have a small battery system that in a passive house could actually, um, you know, give you the potential to uh, power the building uh, with your batteries. Okay, so today we're going to focus on five basic categories here, but we're going to start off with the architectural design considerations. These are the big picture things as an architect when you're laying out the building, when you're uh, conceiving of the project that are really important to helping you achieve passive house uh, cost effectively. So surface area to volume. Um, this is really simple math, but it's really important. And I think the key thing to take away from this was this fire mostly impacted single family homes, which is the single hardest uh, building typology to achieve with passive house simply because the volume that you're heating and cooling um, has the most surface area of any building type. And let me kind of explain what I mean by that. Um, let's look at a duplex, for example. And when you see in the duplex scenario, you're sharing a wall with a neighbor. And so immediately you're already saving 25% of your wall uh, heating, you know, heating or cooling load um, just without spending any money. Um, you're actually probably saving a little bit of money because that that uh, wall is a less expensive wall to build because you don't have an exterior surface. So uh, immediately, this is already easier to do. And then uh, if you go to a townhome where you're sharing two walls, for example, that center unit now has 50% less wall to surface area. So it's 50% less wall area to heat and cool, um, which, which again, lowers your uh, energy demand um, immediately. So um, even though the end units in this case are, are more like the duplex example. The point is that when you have more surface area, it's more difficult to achieve the passive house standard. So um, this brings us to our next slide, which basically shows two floor plan examples. And one uh, is very simple. It's a rectangle, it's a thousand square feet. The one on the, on, on the right, the one on the left you'll see is also a thousand square feet. 
but this one has a more complex shape. And so um, one, you know, the compact example is going to be a lot less, um, inner, you know, a lot less energy use for heating and cooling. And it's going to be less expensive to build because that surface area costs money to build and all those corners cost money to build. So this is really kind of an obvious thing for anyone who's been involved in design or construction for a long time. But it's a really important reminder that when you do the math, uh, the energy modeling, these things really add up quickly. And so you're going to, you know, to get started on the right foot, you're going to be ahead of the game if you just keep the shape simple. Orientation. Uh, this is really important, especially in Colorado. Um, basically, the passive house standard is essentially originally from Germany, where they have cloudy kind of that European uh, climate where you're not getting a, a lot of winter solar radiation. So even though they have a lot of solar in Germany, they have a lot of passive solar uh, windows that have developed and the, the technology has been developed in Germany. Um, they don't have anywhere near the solar resource that we have in the winter here. So the point of this graph, if you look in the winter months, say between January um, and March on the left side of the screen and October and December on the right side of the screen, the solid red line is Boulder and the dashed red line um, is Leipzig, Germany. And this um, is basically for the same uh, type of climate annually in terms of heating degree days. And so we don't need to get into the technical side too much, but essentially that's, um, it, you know, these, these two climates are similar in terms of the amount of heat needed to heat the building on an annual basis. Um, but the difference is Colorado has a massive solar resource. So, so taking advantage of orientation and putting your windows on the south side of the building uh, and your solar panels here, that you get way more bang for your buck with a passive house window and with a solar panel in Colorado than you do in Germany, but they're, they're still worth it in both climates. So, but really important to understand uh, how lucky we are in this particular climate. So um, again, this is pretty basic. This is from uh, online, uh, the susdesign.com website. You can check any solar angle, any time of year for any latitude, longitude, just type in your location. So very uh, easy tool to use and you can donate to their, their website online. But um, the key thing here, is essentially to remember a rule of thumb that in the winter on the south side of the building, you're really looking at a kind of a 45 degree angle, 41 technically maybe for the azimuth angle, but this is a 9 a.m. when the sun comes up in the morning, it's coming in you know, about 45 degrees between the east and south side. And then it's the sun is gonna set at 3 p.m. Um, essentially again at 45 degrees between south and west. So if you just kind of remember generally, that's where the sun is in the winter, that's where we wanna put the windows to harvest free heat um, for our building. Uh, that's that's kind of the key thing just to keep in the back of your mind. You don't need to do detailed you know, calculations on the angles or anything. In general, that's that's the big target we're trying to hit. So now I'm uh, going to let Stephen talk a little bit about the super insulated assemblies that we develop for Passive House. Now we're going to talk about uh, Passive House uh, assemblies, uh, super insulated, uh, wall roof assemblies uh, with lowest cost components, uh, cellulose double stud walls and uh, thick roofs are what we typically use for cost and efficiency. Uh, we'll also look at below grade options for footings and pier foundations. And then uh, Brian will talk about window options, details and uh, optimization strategies. Wall types, um, we've tried pretty much most uh, wall types um, that have high efficiency from conventional framing with bio-based spray foams, uh, rigid insulation on the exterior, uh, including nail base. We've done ICFs, we've done SIP panels, we've done EFIS systems with stucco, and we've done straw bale. And We've always come back to the double stud wall uh, with cellulose insulation uh, for its cost effectiveness and its uh, simplicity uh, in construction. So the double stud wall with cellulose, the advantages um, are that you have strong local knowledge base. Um, any uh, framing contractor can look at a set of plans, knows how to build it. Uh, there's no special training needed. Uh, there's uh, low cost of uh, lumber, um, even with the increased wall, um, given the cost of 
even just standard two by six uh, framing uh, materials. It's the most recyclable, compostable at the end of the product life. Uh, it also uses uh, recycled uh, newspaper and the uh, content. Um, the double stud wall minimizes thermal bridging uh, because you have a continuous uh, cellulose layer uh, in between the two stud walls. It's easy to remodel because you're looking at conventional two by four uh, interior wall construction. And it's simple uh, to execute the uh, exterior air barrier, uh, the connection between foundation, wall, and then wall to ceiling um, is straightforward. There's a long history of success uh, in energy conservation um, in the US with the double stud wall system. So it's, uh, it's a proven uh, system over, over the long term. It's also easy to vary the thickness, um, um, whether you need more insulation as you move into the mountains or higher elevations, uh, you can you know, vary from 12 to 16 inches pretty easily. There's a low carbon, low embodied energy uh, in the uh, wall system. It's got good hydrothermal storage. Uh, the cellulose can hold uh, quite a bit of moisture um, before you would see any uh, issues in the uh, wall system. Lowest cost and best performance for Passive House, uh, in our opinion. There's a good availability of materials uh, in, the, in the assembly. You're looking at standard two by four framing and cellulose is readily available from uh, all insulation companies. And an added benefit is you can upgrade a, and use a smart interior vapor barrier uh, as an added uh, performance and uh, safety uh, measure that uh, keeps the moisture out of the wall assembly, uh, but allows the moisture to escape to the uh, inside. For this reason, we also use plywood sheeting on the exterior because, because it, it becomes more vapor open uh, if it gets wet which helps with the uh, drying out of the assembly. The double wall system goes back. Here's an example from Urbana Champagne uh, from 1976. The locale house uh, where they use triple pane windows, double stud walls, uh, really focusing on continuous insulation. They use raised heel trusses, uh, so there's no thermal bridging at the uh, roof to wall connection. And they introduced the uh, air interior vapor barrier concept. So here's where they ran the vapor uh, retarder barrier, which also worked as a air uh, barrier. They used the triple glaze windows and the insulation under the floor with a service cavity for plumbing uh, inside the uh, heated envelope. So on sunshiny days, moderate, modest southern glazing and super insulation for the wind, low, uh, low energy use house. And then we look back at in 77, the Montana super insulation project, uh, you know, very similar high levels of energy conservation, um, focusing on the envelope again, because rather than looking at more efficient heating and cooling systems to save energy, um, they found that it's better to invest in a super insulated envelope. Uh, and save the energy before you even look at the heating and cooling system. So here we are back 2020, fine home building, the case for the double stud wall, still relevant and in our opinion, still the best solution for uh, our climate zone and labor market. Here's a picture of uh, my house, double stud wall, looks like conventional construction, uh, easy to easy to build and uh, conceptually easy to understand for builders, contractors, um, and everyone involved. And 
there's been good studies about the uh, wall system and uh, moisture. Uh, Building Science Corporation's done some good studies you can check out on their website um, where they've installed moisture meters within wall systems and monitor it through the years, even opening back up wall systems um, when they had high moisture readings and they still found no signs of uh, mold or, or any, anything. And one other key to the, uh, to the wall system is achieving passive house air sealing, um, which is required for the wall system and assembly to uh, work properly. So you have wall air flowing through the wall system, uh, you have a higher chance of moisture uh, buildup. As I just mentioned, the air sealing is a uh, is key component. Um, this is both about the construction execution and the design um, that makes the field work easy. Uh, you really need to think through the sequencing because the air sealing is a critical piece. Uh, and if you don't pass the air tightness test, you will not get passive house. And this is a, an entire uh, system. The ceiling needs to go down to the foundation, underneath the uh, slabs, uh, and up over the roof uh, and fully, fully enclose the building. On the right, we show a blower door test. Uh, this is the way that you test. Uh, to make sure you're achieving this, we do uh, one before drywall typically so that you can identify uh, any leaks in the uh, house uh, before uh, you get too far where it's hard to fix those. Uh, and then we do one post uh, construction to verify uh, that we've reached the uh, air tightness. Uh, and as you see in the numbers, this, this was actually the test for my house. Uh, it's roughly a little over 3,000 square foot house and the leakage was only 163 CFM at 50 pascals, uh, which is extremely tight. And as we look at some foundation details, uh, here's a drilled pier foundation with a structural uh, slab. In this scenario, you put the uh, vapor barrier or the air barrier on the inside of the concrete and then you're, you insulate inside of that um, to get your continuous air barrier. Uh, and then for the floor system, you can come back with a secondary uh, slab for finished concrete, or you can frame uh, a floor in there as well. If you're allowed to do a mono slab uh, solution, depending on your soils conditions, uh, it's best to insulate on the outside of the concrete. This allows the concrete interior of uh, your insulation and you can use it, the thermal mass, to uh, help maintain interior temperatures. Uh, in this case, the uh, air barrier moves to the exterior of the concrete as well. And then we move to the uh, roof assemblies. Uh, this is a key detail, kind of the air barrier transition between the walls to the roof. Um, here we show a vented roof assembly, um, which allows you to get all cellulose uh, insulation, uh, where we use prefab trusses and then the air barrier shown in red wraps up and over taping all the seams on the uh, sheeting wall to ceiling. And then you come back with a two by four layer uh, over the top of that to create your uh, air barrier layer. It uh, can also be achieved in an unvented roof assembly, same uh, construction till the air barrier. And then instead of doing a two by four layer, you do a uh, rigid foam layer, either with nail base or uh, rigid foam with uh, plywood over that uh, screwed down. And then this, this assembly also allows the air barrier a little um, protection from the roofing. Uh, so you're not getting a bunch of roofing nail penetrations through that assembly. And then here we just show some typical wall uh, sections from a standard code uh, wall uh, built in Boulder with the green building requirements. We have R10 continuous insulation on the exterior, uh, R19 cavity insulation, which is a two by six 
uh, wall construction, and then an R3 30% solar heat gain coefficient window. On the right, we show a project we completed in Boulder uh, four years ago, which uh, is a double stud wall. So you get R29 continuous between the studs with R25 cavity insulation in the two uh, separate stud walls. R10 passive house certified windows and doors with a 50% solar heat gain coefficient. Um, and then one thing that, that with these two different assemblies is the cost difference is, is minimal between the two assemblies because the cost of the rigid insulation uh, and the labor to install it is a easy trade-off for the extra cellulose insulation and then the extra labor to uh, install that additional two by four wall. So here's just a summary of the cost cellulose at uh, R 3.6 per inch approximately is generally a third the cost of uh, spray foam or rigid foam board uh, installed. So that's where you're getting the savings um, on the insulation side and the uh, all cellulose assembly. And then air sealing for materials labor generally run around $3 a square foot. Um, if you're using good quality air sealing tapes and products and then uh, the labor, which roughly equates to about uh, $10,000 per job, uh, depending on the size, that's probably for your average 2,500 to 3000 square foot house. And then if you want to add uh, an extra uh, security, and uh, performance of the interior smart vapor barrier, you're looking at an additional two to $3,000 for that. And here's where I'll hand it back over to Brian to talk about uh, passive house windows. So windows are probably the, one of the most critical components of passive house to making the math work in the end. And um, we're, we're gonna dive into why this is so important um, because they are expensive per square foot uh, on face value when you first look at them, but they pay off in a lot of ways. And we're going to look at that. So typically they're going to far exceed what you see in the common U S market. They're going to be from R seven to R 10. Um, this is achieved with triple glazing. It's achieved with uh, warm edge spacers. And so that's a really thick triple glazing assembly too. It's typically double what you would see in the U S. So it's, it's almost two inches thick in most cases. Um, and it's a really beautiful low iron clear glass. It's not going to have that green tint you see with some cheaper U.S. windows. Um, so this is um, kind of a luxury feature, but it's typical and common in Europe to use this glass. So it doesn't come at a cost premium in that market. Uh, the uh, the warm edge spacer is, is one of the weak points of all windows. A lot of energy leaks at the joint where the glass panes uh, come together with the frame. And so not using a metal spacer but using a, a super uh, high-tech composite spacer is really important here. Um, and you can see in this particular window design that there's actually foam insulation that wraps around that spacer on both sides, inside and outside the window to make this window perform even better. Um, and so these are certified products. They're modeled uh, two-dimensionally in thermal modeling programs and certified both in the U.S. and in Europe for their uh, performance in, in all their types, from their lift and slide doors to tilt turn windows to just simple fixed windows. And there are multiple brands available in the U.S. Um, and uh, even manufactured locally with Alpen uh, windows here in uh, Gun Barrel uh, in Boulder County. So there's there's a lot of options. So they are available um, in the marketplace um, and are pretty easy to get. Um, and let's just take a look at this slide really quickly, but it's basically just giving you kind of a graphic indication of, in terms of insulation value on these windows, um, just, just so you understand that, you know, the code minimum windows, you can go buy a window that's R2 or R3, and that's still somewhat common um, in, in the U.S. Uh, this is illegal in Europe, but, um, you know, the, the, these windows exist. And then you get into the Energy Star website online, you can find uh, what they call their most efficient windows, which are going to range in this like high uh, mid to high threes to up to the seven, eight range. And um, 
you know, if you just look at the Energy Star website, you might think this is the top of what's possible, but it's not because the passive house window market really starts at kind of the R5 point and is going to go up uh, for the quad pane products that are typically used in uh, Alaska or really extreme uh, climates up to the, you know, the, the 14 range. So, so really the passive house window is the premium uh, best practices technology that's available on the market. And that's why it's so important is because, um, uh, you know, it has a very high R value compared to a lot of the other products in the market. So it's, it's one of the areas you can't skimp. Um, so the other misconception, I think that we want to clear up with people that a lot of people think that windows lose energy. Um, and this is actually not true with a passive house window. And um, in Colorado on the front range climate, an R10 passive house window on the south side of a building is going to gain you about four units of heating energy for everyone you lose on an annual basis. So essentially for a modest house, a two or 3000 square foot house, this is like getting a three or five kilowatt PV system for free um, because these windows are gonna help heat your home uh, during the winter heating season. So it's a big deal. And the reason this, uh, this it works this way and that typical US windows that we have uh, we're most experience with are, they are in fact a, a net losers on an annual basis and they do you know cost you money on an annual basis and the reason is one that the r value is too low they don't have enough insulation uh, they're typically only double pane they have metal spacers uh, the frame's not well insulated enough and so they're going to lose a lot of energy and the second reason is that most of them also have a low solar heat gain coefficient. Um, and there's a lot of history and, and reasons why this exists because it wasn't always this way in the US, but um, essentially they have lower solar heat gain coefficient. So they're rejecting a lot of that winter heat that otherwise could come through that window um, and, and heat your house for free. So this little screenshot is from the passive house planning package. It just shows that when you put a US typical kind of R3 window into the software, the blue, uh, basically uh, the, uh, the blue tab is the uh, transmission losses on an annual basis for all the different uh, facades of the building. And the last number on the bottom is the total of all facades, uh, north, south, east, and west. And in this case, zero is the, uh, the glass, like a skylight. We don't have any skylights in this project. And then on the right side, in the yellow column is the uh, heat gains annually, useful heat gains to help heat your house in kilobitus per year. And um, that totals at the bottom. So now if we contrast that to a passive house window by comparison, we're gonna see now a window that has three or four times the insulating value, and it's gonna let in um, you know, almost twice the amount of solar energy in the winter as a uh, North American low solar heat gain window that you would see with it with, with a lower solar heat gain coefficient. And so what happens is these these columns now flip. So now you can see in the blue column, we're you losing about 10,000 kBTUs per year from the window. So they do lose some energy when it's cold, it's true at night. But the most important thing is because of their characteristics, their thermal characteristics, the physics of high, being highly insulated and have a high solar heat gain coefficient, this is the greenhouse effect, right? The sun is um, coming in those windows and it's not going back out. And so now you have a 38,000 KBTU uh, gain on an annual basis. So essentially, um, you know, a four to one annual net gain um, from these windows. So these, these windows are energy winners and not energy losers on an annual basis. And they play a significant role in heating the house, especially in the front range climate of Colorado. Um, on the east and west, it's also important to note that you will not gain as much because obviously the sun is rising in the east in the morning. And so your west windows won't get any useful sun in the winter until later in the day. Um, and then um, in, in, the, in the afternoon, your west windows will be gaining useful energy in the winter, but they won't get it in the morning. So that's why you see a two to one net gain on the east and west from this same kind of R10 50% uh, SHGC window. I just wanted to show this example of a, uh, this is a company on the East Coast that does passive house, but just to give you a visual example of what a good kind of very simple passive house, cost-effective passive house window design is. So it's very elegant, it's very simple, it uses very large panes of glass, uh, but it's also kind of grand and uh, you know um, spectacular also because of that floor to ceiling glass using those large panes, but, but it's very economical. You can see on this, on this south facade, Essentially, they're not using very many windows. 
um, but they're, they're putting them in the right place and they're taking advantage of that winter heating. So in general, we, we just want to face most of the glass south. And uh, this is uh, some of our work. You don't need this much glass uh, for the math to work. And you'll see that when you do your energy modeling. But this is more for lifestyle and um, indoor outdoor living that everybody loves here. Um, so what happens when you do this, when you, you know, kind of overglaze the south is that you, you will actually save more energy in the model. Uh, because you know you'll gain more in the winter time, and your annual heating demand will go down. Uh, the problem is you've got to be careful because what's happening at the same time is that that uh, R10 glass and at nighttime is still not as good as your R60 wall, and so your 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 heating system size is going to have to go up slightly. So it is a delicate balance, and it's something you want to look at in the model, um, and it's also something that you really need to focus on appropriate shading. Uh, so you don't overheat the building, both in the summer and in the winter, where we can have warm days in the winter where the sun's coming in. So we need to be able to shade that glass properly. While operability is desired, uh, a good passive house designer, a good passive house architect is going to be really strategic about where they place those operable windows. The lift and slide doors are becoming more common. You see these more and more in the U.S. market for, for luxury indoor outdoor living. I think the key here is just trying to use them in, you know, uh, sparingly in the uh, the main living spaces in most ho homes, unless you you know have a larger budget, then you can kind of you know use them more judiciously. But uh, essentially, they typically end up in the kitchen, living, dining area, and then in the bedrooms and secondary spaces. You're just going to see uh, tilt turn windows for egress and a little bit of ventilation. But the majority, the vast majority, can be fixed, and that's where you're going to save the most money. Um, larger fixed windows and fewer number of units, fewer number to install fewer to um to tape and air seal and uh and and it's just fewer units you have to buy in general so that's that's how you can achieve passive house window glazing for essentially the same cost as a conventional budget in a conventional design where you might have more windows but they're kind of thrown around randomly throughout the whole house and you're buying more of them um and so but, but they're not uh, really carefully thought through so this is one of the most uh, expensive parts of the building we typically spend 10 to 15 percent of the budget on windows, um, but it's also one of the most critical. On the north facade, you can see just a simple punched openings, uh, less glazing, uh, just really here getting ventilation and egress from the critical spaces. So just in summary, the way to make this affordable to do passive house, uh, we want fewer window units total, which leads you kind of to, in general to a more modern, elegant design. Um, larger pieces of glass, so the windows, the views can still be captured. You still get um, really spectacular architectural spaces, but you're just going to have uh, fewer and larger pieces. And then uh, most windows on the south, to, like I said, to gain that useful winter heat energy that's going to lower our annual heat demand. Um, but um, and uh, try to minimize the number of operable windows just to keep that cost per square foot down on your total window budget. So for shading. Um, you will need proper shading. This is absolutely critical. These windows are very powerful and they work as, uh, as designed. They will heat your house. So if we don't shade them with, um, these are external electronically controlled um, blinds. Uh, this is uh, common in Europe, but less common here. Typically a lot of our window coverings go on the inside, but these are exterior, which keeps the heat out on the east and west facades. Uh, whereas the south, it's somewhat easier to shade just with a horizontal overhang because, again, of the sun angles. So in the, in the south, you're going to have um, a high 73 degree sun angle in the summertime that you can easily block with that horizontal overhang. And um, when, it's, when it's really low in the sky in the summertime, it's actually coming from the north side. Um, so it's, it's a non-issue. So the south is really easy to shade economically with a simple overhang. The other facades, I know uh, everyone in Colorado on the front range <laughs> is always going to want those west windows to look at the mountains. And that's fine as long as you're uh, careful about how many of them you do and, and make sure you're shading them properly because they're not going to be as effective in a heating capacity as the south facing windows. Um, and they could be costly to your cooling budget um, if, if you overdo it or fail to shade them properly. All right, now let's uh, move on to mechanical systems. Now we're going to talk about mechanical systems. Uh, there's a couple different options uh, that we've used and uh, depending on your price point and uh, what you would like, uh, 
that can be fit. So there's geothermal options. Uh, there's mini split systems, um, which can be zoned. And then there's radiant options. And then I'll also, uh, we'll talk about ventilation systems, uh, which is also a critical piece to uh, Passive House. First, I'll just mention that uh, there are uh, tax incentives for geothermal, um, which brings down the price point to make it uh, more cost effective and uh, closer in cost to uh, mini split systems than previous. Uh, these tax credits expire in 2024, so um, check them out and uh, consult uh, your tax uh, accountant uh, to make sure that you were able to take these credits. So uh, geothermal versus air source. Um, here's a quick um, analysis of the uh, costs. Uh, this is based on my house uh, where I did geothermal. So you're looking at roughly 10K in the drilling, 7,000 in materials uh, for the units. And then you also have the uh, ducting and install costs. So total about 40,000, um, 10,400 of that you'd get back um, in tax credits. Um, so then you're looking at total cost 29,600. And with the air source heat pump, for example, if you used five mini split units, um, and this depends, you know, greatly on the size and the configuration of the house on how many units in the spacing, um, you know, roughly 5,000 each, you're looking at about 25,000. So there's a, you know, an upgrade cost there. Um, but if you get the heating loads down low enough, uh, you can definitely get away with diff, uh, smaller units, uh, number of units. Uh, here's a picture showing, uh, the ceiling cassette units you'll see in the center of the ceiling. Um, if you want to hide the uh, air source heat pump uh, units. And then here in the upper left, you see the uh, wall mounted unit uh, that most people are um, more used to seeing typically. Uh, in this house, we uh, did three units. It's about 2000 square feet. Um, so there's the cost there. Um, Radiant options are out there. They tend to be more expensive um, so that you can do solar thermal radiant, um, which is great, uh, super efficient for heating. Um, and then in extremely low load homes, um, if you get uh, the heating demand down, you can do electric radiant. Um, in these scenarios, typically we would just do uh, radiant in the bathrooms or the kitchen uh, where you're really going to feel that uh, heat on your feet. Um, and this is a more useful in a mountain climate where cooling is less of an issue um, because if you bring in cooling costs, then it drives uh, either another system or if you're going to do a radiant system with cooling, that drives the cost up pretty significantly. ERVs or en energy recovering ventilators uh, is a v big part of Passive House. With Passive House air tightness, um, which you want and need, uh, you also need to then bring in fresh air because you're not getting the leakage through the uh, wall roof assemblies. So we do this uh, with an ERV, which brings in constant fresh air. Um, from the outside, this air is filtered. The air is, the heat or cooling from the outgoing air is transferred to the incoming uh, air to um, recover about 90 to 95% uh, of that heat. Um, this is a unit that we have really fallen back on over and over because uh, it's Passive House certified, it's, um, really quiet, which homeowners uh, love, and uh, we haven't really gotten any complaints. They also have their uh, their own proprietary duct system, um, which is easier to run 
um, than larger ducts. It fits in a two by four wall. So it's pretty easy to uh, distribute um, the ventilation throughout the house uh, with their system. So the cost of install uh, typically is a little bit lower um, and you don't need a highly trained technicians to, uh, to install their system. Um, and there are other systems out there. You can sp spend less, but you know, these are the lungs of the building. Um, and so for in their air quality comfort, um, you really want to invest in a quality system that, uh, is going to provide great indoor air quality that's filtered. And with that, I'll uh, hand it over to Brian to talk about solar and renewable ready details. All right, so with Passive House, the really excellent thing that it does as a side attribute um, is it, it lowers your loads to the point where battery backup becomes viable um, for your, uh, your heating system. So it, you know, the battery uh, costs keep coming down. Um, super capacitors are becoming a possibility in the future, I think for, uh, for, uh, stationary storage as well. So I think we're going to see technology in the future very much open up where when we have extreme weather events, um, when we, uh, when the utility power goes down, um, passive house makes it more feasible for the, for battery backup to work. And the other interesting thing is uh, with the electric, more and more electric vehicles coming on the market from major manufacturers, I think we're also seeing that um, electric vehicles can also be the backup because those batteries are so large. Um, you could run your house for days or even weeks uh, in, a, in, a, in an, an extreme situation. So um, really interesting, um, uh, you know, that we're, we're at the intersection now of where technology has matured in the solar uh, and battery range, um, as well as we're, we're doing passive house now. So the efficiency is so high that these things are coming together and creating um, a more resilient uh, possibility for people at a much more reasonable price. Whereas I think, you know, 10 years ago, this was only, you know, for the, you know, for really expensive uh, projects where you could do this. So um, why the utility is probably interested in offering you uh, rebates for passive house that we're looking at today from Excel is that this really helps with peak shaving. So uh, what that means is that there are certain periods of the day where the utility, you know, is basically maxed out on how much energy they can supply. So peak air conditioning loads in the afternoon, in the summertime, again, passive houses have much lower loads, so they're not going to be contributing as much to that. Um, and with batteries, you can actually potentially with time of use um, uh, rates that are, I think are coming and part of our future nationwide um, we're going to see the opportunity to sell back power to the utility when when they need it and you don't because you're living in a passive house and then you're only using uh, the grid basically to top off your batteries or use it when um, uh, you know it's it's kind of a really cold day or maybe um, you know a really a really hot day too you might use a little air conditioning but um, essentially um, you know, the, the, the efficiencies that you're gaining by going with passive house, just open up all these other opportunities, um, both for the utility, for the user, um, for resilience, for communities, everything. So this is really exciting that this is happening. We've technically, um, at this point, mostly been using the Tesla Powerwall and the LG batteries, but again, this market segment is rapidly growing. Um, you can even order batteries online from Amazon and, you know, um, piece together your own, you know, home system. Um, that will run all your lighting and appliances. Um, so, you know, definitely an emerging uh, part of the market and emerging technology associated with Passive House. Um, okay, let's talk about the um, benefits and uh, overview. And now we'll wrap up with the uh, benefit um, of doing Passive House overview. So one of the benefits, um, typically if you're doing a, passive house that is optimizing uh, the shape, uh, you tend to end up with a little bit more modern design uh, style, which gives you simpler form, clean lines, um, and currently represents the market trend uh, as far as uh, resale in, uh, in this area goes. So you'll be uh, ahead of the curve there. Um, 
And here is an, ex an example from the same architect um, about basically hitting different price points uh, with Passive House. On the left, you have a uh, super custom vacation uh, home. And then on the right, you have a Habitat for Humanity duplex, um, both meeting Passive House and by the same architect. So uh, just an example of, you know, being able to hit uh, different price points and uh, still achieving uh, the high efficiency. Uh, another benefit um, of Passive House is with the super insulation and air tightness. Uh, not only do you get the draft-free, uh, comfortable home uh, in all seasons, uh, it's also quieter um, as a side benefit uh, because of that added insulation and triple pane windows and the air sealing, um, the noise doesn't transmit, uh, which can le lead to better sleep. Uh, also, you know, less outside noise pollution, airplanes, trains, you know, high winds, uh, et cetera, uh, which leads to a more peaceful interior environment. Um, and that's nice. And another added benefit, um, most passive house designs tend to lead to uh, good natural daylighting, um, which then reduces the need for uh, indoor uh, lighting. And typically uh, we're doing 100% LED lighting as well uh, to bring down uh, energy use. By putting uh, renewables on your roof, getting those tax credits from the solar, uh, really getting your loads down to the absolute minimum for heating and cooling, um, using efficient appliances and heat recovery ventilation equipment, um, you know, you're setting yourself up for a resilient house in the case of any kind of power outage. Um, and uh, you really make it possible, I think, with today's technology and tomorrow's technology with the next five years, I think we're going to be seeing a lot more people, you know, backing up their HVAC system or having that capability to back up their HVAC system um, from from batteries. And um, and even if the power goes out, you can kind of keep living your life. So so we're very close to this, I think. And um, I think I know a lot of people are already kind of doing this now. Um, indoor air. This is uh, you know one of the side benefits I think of, of passive house electrification, electric appliances. But it's key to remember that your whole house ventilation system, this premium ventilation system you're putting in, is going to be constantly removing pollutants from the kitchen. Um, you probably still want to use, uh, you know, a hood for exhaust and uh, control of, of some of the other uh, pollutants and, and particulate. Um, however, um, induction cooking specifically is very efficient and uh, based on some of the testing at Lawrence Berkeley Labs, the byproducts, obviously, of that uh, cooking are the least harmful of either gas or even regular electric cooktops. Um, and, and gas, when they, when they look at uh, the system around the country even, you see leaks coming from the entire distribution system, not just within your house, which they've also recently identified, um, that a lot of the gas stoves just leak in general. Um, but yeah, um, you know, just removing gas from the house is kind of a peace of mind for people who are concerned about their own personal um, health and, and the indoor air quality of, of their house. Uh, and it saves money with, the, you know, skipping the cost of that connection to your house in the first place and all those plumber uh, connections to uh, hook up each individual plant. So um, just removing gas completely from the house is certainly the, the path forward and uh, sort of a side benefit of passive house. Induction cooking, uh, there's been a lot of articles and information on this. Uh, currently, if you haven't done this, try it. Um, you know, it's definitely superior to gas once you've gotten used to it. And I think one of the most exciting parts about induction cooking is that, uh, for example, my parents have the cheapest IKEA uh, induction cooktop and, it, you know, it's $800 and I've cooked on this cooktop. It works great. In fact, it works you know, identically um, to the Thermador uh, Freedom Induction Cooktop I had at our previous house um, that we used. The only advantage of this one is you can put a pot anywhere and it kind of senses the size of the pot and turns on the magnets appropriate to the size of the pot. But um, while that's kind of a fancy feature, the actual cooking experience, the control uh, is no different between lowest cost models and the highest cost models. So 
again, this just makes it really um, accessible to people or for all different project types. You can spend 800 or you can spend $5,800 on that range. And, you know, one is maybe a little more luxury, um, has some more features that might appeal to some homeowners building a really nice house that, you know, want to invest in their appliances. Um, um, but and the other one can go, you know, um, and, and it performs exactly the same um, for the most affordable project. So to sum up um, what we hope to share with everyone today and what we hope that uh, everyone will be able to take advantage of with this is some of these optimization tips that really are pretty simple. But if you keep them um, at the forefront of your design from the beginning, the first concept that with the shape, keeping things simple, um, you know, all the way to the end of where you're figuring out the details of how you tape your windows to your, your air barrier and, you know, get your ventilation system, uh, you know, in your mechanical room and tied in with the rest of your house. Those, those details at the very end, we're, we're hoping that this is kind of a, and you can benefit from 10 years of our experience of doing this in the in Boulder, uh, in Louisville, um, and around Colorado, um, and learning some hard lessons. Um, so, so this is really uh, the goal is to get mass adoption. And I think um, some of these things um, are really easy to achieve. And then some of them, they might take the assistance of a professional. You might need someone to help you uh, select the right heat pump or the right. Uh, a geothermal system, you know, help you lay out your uh, mechanical uh, ventilation system that we, we showed you. Um, but some of this stuff is also um, just from the very beginning, just the very basic concept. You know, look at some of the pictures we provided, keep it simple, and uh, you should be able to reap the benefits of that simplicity in your budget, as well as in your long-term comfort and the value of the project. So we'll go ahead and uh, move to the question section. Stephen, Brian, thank you so much for helping us wrap our minds around what Passive House is and the definitely highlights of how does this work. I think that'll be a really great resource. So thank you so much for putting that together. So we've had a ton of questions come in. Um, Michael from our board, Shannon from our board are in the background organizing them by topic. So I'm just going to start with some bigger items. I want to start with cost just to, it's always the first thing people want to talk about. Um, and there are two questions specifically that kind of get to different themes that we can talk about and then um, we'll move into other, other topics. So the first question, which I think helps kind of understand passive house philosophy in a, at a larger scale in terms of construction cost is, is a double stud wall framing twice the cost of a single stud wall. And how does that play out? Now, but because the, the interior wall is basically an interior framed wall, there's no structural headers. Um, there's, there's no sheeting on the outside of that interior wall. So um, it's definitely, it's not, yeah, it's not, you know, wall X times two, um, mm -hmm. I would say if it, you know, half the cost of the exterior wall or, or even less given current uh, costs of sheeting and other uh, materials. And I think the thing to add to that too is, um, the, you know, the common, uh, you know, we basically have only built passive house projects. So we're not super aware of what everyone else is doing in the conventional market, but I talked to my insulator today. I was like, well, what is everyone else doing? And what we see a lot of times is a two by six with uh, what's called flash and fill, or it's they'll do a couple inches of spray foam, um, which right now he's telling me is a dollar sixty something a square foot. Um, so with the petroleum um, costs currently, this is even higher than it was two months ago or something. So um, when when you take the, the cost savings from the cellulose per R versus the high cost of spray foam, um, and then the also additional cost of the two by six versus the two by four. Um, you you actually that wall assembly might cost somewhere close to the same amount. Yeah. And then I think another thing with the um, and this is again systems thinking. So passive house with a simple envelope, a lot of times has a more open floor plan. And when you get that, a lot of the um, the stud framing that you might do in a conventional house with lots of built-in closets and little short hallways and nooks and crannies, if you added up all those studs 
and you took a good passive house product uh, that you've seen from you know for the from the, some of the East Coast examples we showed, EcoCore or um, or Geologic, you know those guys they're, they're really minimizing also the interior framing. So some of the efficiency of passive house is just efficiency also on the interior framing and keeping a very simple, um, very open floor plan with without waste of hallways or um, uh, you know kind of a lot of nooks and crannies that also take up a lot of framing. I agree. It was interesting in my first project that I did with higher energy goals, my contractor and my client and our team, we all wanted to understand like, what's the best way to approach this? And we did the same thing you've done throughout your practices. Okay, well, here are four wall types. Here's our basic code wall. Here are three other types of walls that would get us equal performance from an R value perspective. And, you know, we worked with our energy consultant on what those walls would be. And then our contractor went and priced them and the double stud wall was the least expensive. And actually, and you know, we were doing this during COVID. So the lumber prices were soaring and we were worried about lumber costs. And it was surprising to me. And I don't, I don't remember the figures or percentages now, but really because it's not a structural wall, because it's simplifying other details throughout the project, because we're using less expensive insulation, those balances really offset. So it's, yeah, it's not as painful as you would think, kind of taking the satellite view without considering all the nuances. Um, the other question, moving away from hard costs of passive house, though, um, we're, we're definitely going to circle back to that. And actually, Stephen, can you just speak to the cost per square foot for the house you just completed? Project cost, construction, soft cost, whatever, just so people have kind of a basis for for what you're experiencing right now. Yeah, and some some of this was approximated because uh, you know I performed you know a lot of the tasks um, because it was for myself. Um, mm -hmm. But in calculating in those costs that a normal person would pay, um, basically we were figuring around three hundred fifty dollars a square foot, um, and that's all inclusive permit fees, architecture, engineering. Um, basically, yeah, finished product. Yeah, that's that's great. And I, truthfully, that's what we're seeing um, throughout the market, talking to other builders, homeowners who are getting started working through this process. So that's really competitive. Um, can you speak specifically to the certification process and the investment in those soft costs and what those soft costs look like um, just broadly? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's really going to vary, and um, you know, this I, I'm glad you asked that question because this is one of those things I think that we've had conversations with, um, you know, people in some local nonprofits and in the government because you know, and, and this is almost like a softball question. I'm really glad you asked this because what I was hoping to get out of our presentation and um, for jurisdictions to adopt maybe was, um, for example, you know, EMU has their pilot. A passive house program where they're actually giving you these details that are pre-vetted and it's already been figured out. And so if you join this EMU pilot program, you're going to get all that information and it's, it's done. So if the government could help with this portion of it, so we're not making, you know, 80 prototypes here where everyone's doing it slightly different. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's going to be a massive cost savings. I know, you know, I mentioned um, in the warm up here for this call with just the, um, Panel panelists here that um, you know FIAS has a uh, prescriptive path method, and I think PHI is really ramping up to support um, the local designers and training and and uh, certification. You know, so I really I, I think in the past it has to be honest. Yes, it's it has been complicated and it can be expensive, and there can be multiple rounds of review where you're paying, um, you know, for for this review process, and it can get very complicated. But my hope. And I think the weakness of the passive house movement to date has really been that, that, you know, um, this is the, the, it, if you're doing 50 homes in a subdivision and you can just certify one and then repeat that home 50 times, it's very economical. If you're doing a one-off prototype for everybody who has to go through this, very expensive. Um, so I'm really hoping that what we, our experience has been in the past is not the one in the future. And I think that's the one we have to work uh, together as a community moving forward. Yeah, I agree. There, the um, 
concern or sort of impression was always that and I love passive house as a pathway. I know people question why we keep talking about passive house, but I think as a as a gradient, if we're talking, you know, light green to forest green of how high performance do you want your project to be? Um, and I don't know, I stole that from somebody at our event last week. So thanks for that, guys. Um, passive house is a really good guideline, no matter where you're headed. Cert getting certified is its own hurdle and there's paperwork and everybody hates paperwork, but I agree. I think that we're on this path um, with local jurisdictions and as a community that allows us in a way that wasn't really available before to create a streamlined pathway where passive house is accepted. And I think a prescriptive method is perfect for that. Um, okay, so I wanna go into a couple design basics about passive house. What are, what is the ACH for a blower door test in a passive house? And what, how does that compare to a standard code compliant kind of ACH? Um, well, the, the passive house methodology is gonna be a 0.6 at 50 typically. Um, and then in FIAS, you're looking at um, the, like a, what is it? 0.04 CFM per square foot of surface area, which for a compact building with nine foot ceilings is approximately the same thing, um, but it's designed in that case to test the, what you're really looking for, which is the quality of the building envelope and the amount of air leakage uh, more specifically. So, but in Europe where this came from, um, usually it was more compact anyway. So, you know, the European standard worked the same way. So, um, you know, I've the just, I know that's a lot of technical garbage jargon, <laughs> mm -hmm. but what I've always heard is pass house leakage is like this. And then, um, you know, a regular house leakage is like, you know, a window being open in your house. So I think that's what people um, uh, maybe relate to a little bit better. Um, but you're really, you're really trying to get it to be like, you know, a space suit for NASA or a nuclear submarine. I mean, when you're working on a project, that should be your goal. Yeah. Um, you know, don't think, oh, well, that's just a little three foot section, you know, whatever, nobody will, nobody will know if I go to lunch right now and we start on the roof later. So you can't do that. You gotta yeah. be, you gotta be crazy and meticulous. You do the way that I, and we, this is a question we received. So I think we have just a mix of people here, some professionals, some homeowners. So to our homeowners, that's why we all partner as teams. I don't know everything. Brian doesn't know everything. We work collaboratively and homeowners don't have to understand all of these things, but we also want to support professionals that are diving into this, um, this world and pathway. The way I've heard about, I've heard about ACH is just as a broad kind of what are the relative markers is, you know, traditional house might be 3.0 to 5.0 traditionally ACH. A good house that you can probably build without going being really meticulous is around a 1.0. And that means you're being thoughtful, but you're not, you know, you're kind of somewhere in the middle. And that gets you the performance and the impact on your mechanical system at a one ACH versus a three is phenomenal. Like you've just reduced the number of geothermal wells you think you're gonna dig by half or a third. And then the 0 0.6 does take attention, practice, sequencing, um, and that's where you get that passive house certification. So there's a really wide range, 0 0.6 to five. We don't want five. Um, just broadly speaking, we, I know there's a lot of variables that change this, but what are in this climate in Boulder County, in Louisville, what are your general R values that you're shooting for, for walls and roof? You know, I guess, um... You know, the the way we've looked at this, um, we're probably more on the conservative side on the walls. We're doing, you know, I think in this climate, you can do like a 10 to 12 inch cellulose wall and probably get away with it. Mm -hmm. We've kind of used 16 because of some technical thermal bridge calculations um, in the PHPP with, uh, at, you know, at R, you know, 15, 16 being kind of the limit. And so because wood is R1 per inch, when you get to 16 inches, if you have a couple extra beams going all the way through the wall, mm -hmm. it's it's not really considered a thermal bridge. So we've we've kind of moved to that, and um, even though it's maybe a bit excessive, um, so and the same thing goes in the roof. We kind of use the same thickness in the roof. Mm -hmm. um, classically, in passive house, people have um, 
I wouldn't say cheated, but they've biased their energy model by overdoing the roof because it's an easy place to put a lot of insulation that's continuous. Um, uh, and in more recent times, um, I think some of the slab insulation has been found to be actually beneficial if you reduce it and do slightly more ground coupling in some building topologies. Some of the uh, past house conferences I've attended recently, you know, I think people are starting to see a benefit from reduced slab insulation. So we we were doing like a 40 you know, 50 before, and now, you know, maybe we're backing that off one to conserve foam or mineral wool is hard to get right now. It's expensive. It's hard to get. So um, those are the types of insulations ideally that we would use, try to use less of and, and below grade where you're working to the ambient ground temperature um, or as the climate warms, you know, you know, cooling is becoming a bigger issue on the front range, maybe than heating. So, so really um, I think the trend is towards, you know, maybe a more uh, uh, liberal, ground insulation in the in the 30 range uh, but trying to keep your walls at that 50 60 and then 80 in the roofs is a cheater way to save a little bit more in your your calculations but 60 70 is probably um you're at the point of diminishing returns kind of in there somewhere i think you brought up two really good points one is and andrew mitchell talked about this when he was presenting if you try to just meet the standard just barely meet the ACH, just barely meet the R value. You're really modeling and tracking things aggressively, which is expensive. It's a lot of soft costs on your designer, on your consultant, on your contractor. If you kind of like round up in some of these areas, especially where it's cheap material, you know, I think we have, we struggle on the more compact sites with that wall, this, the area of that wall really having an impact, but, um, it makes life easier from that, that regard. Um, the other thing you mentioned that I think is important that I've already forgotten in my mind, so we will have to come back to it. I no, don't I, remember what else I was gonna say. Well, let, me, let, me, let me interrupt you, because I think that's a great way of saying it. You're rounding up or in structural engineering terms, like your engineer doesn't sign, d design your roof beam to be like just barely strong enough, right? Yeah. They're probably going to have a, 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 a you know safety factor, it's called, right, mm -hmm. of, of a lot. And so we look at the wall assemblies the same way. And I think that's a really good way to describe how past cost people typically do the roofs, too. It's, it's just a safety factor. It's, a, it's an easy place to add more insulation. And yeah, if you're on a really tight site with um, limited wall thicknesses, some of the other wall systems we mentioned may be more appropriate for you or... Right. Um, um, you know, if you have in this, in this market coming up that we're going to face a lot of the stuff, even we talked about today with double studs, you might get better pricing from a prefabricated solution because you can't get uh, trained skilled contractors to put these pass house walls together and you might be better off ordering the whole thing and it shows up and you just tape the seams together and you're done. So uh, I don't think there's one, um, perfect answer, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, you know, for any of these questions. And that's where you have to do some of the modeling. But like you said, if you if you can make it a simple shape, if you can mostly face it south, you're going to be saving those hours you're talking about with your consultant and your architect going back and forth. Like if you if you go overboard as much as you can on, on the on the concepts and the basics, then you won't probably have to go get bitten by the details because you're you've you've cut it too close when you get down to the 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 last um, little the last you, bit. Yeah. And that reminds me of my other point, which is you talked about that 16 inch wall being helpful in thermal bridging. And for our homeowners or people coming into Passive House for the first time, a thermal bridge is anywhere like a steel beam going through a wall where that you don't have a lot of insulation to help resist cold or hot entering your conditioned space. And what happens is you get cold and hot touching each other, which you don't want because then you get condensation. Um, I did a double stud wall at 12 inches and we have to be really mindful about where we have steel and treat those areas differently and make sure we don't have you know that condensation point in those areas and th that requires you know a different type of insulation re requires foam it requires a different laborer a different detail and so by doing that 16 inches you're simplifying your life in a lot of ways by just like creating a non-issue in some of those conditions that we see a lot in smaller, thinner walls. Um, okay, next question. It looks like many passive houses don't have much in the way of overhangs. How do you achieve good passive solar design without overhangs? 
And th this is a lesson that we've learned from actually doing passive house the last 10 years and using these windows because they are powerful. Like they do work and your house will get hot in the winter from these windows. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's why we showed the slide with the active shading um, because in general, that is our preferred method um, on all facades, if you can afford it. It's an expensive method. Um, and so, you know, for some projects, it may not make sense. So in that case, yes, you want to do an overhang on the south facing windows. Um, but, you know, on the east and west, it's really hard to build fins or, um, you know, vertical fins, because now you're talking about a different solar angle. Um, the, the south is the only one really you can get away with with just the horizontal overhang. Um, but the, the, the exterior shading really gives you options. You can control glare. You can control, you know, heating very carefully in the winter. We have 70 degree days in February and January now. So um, that same low sun angle, you can't just do it with overhangs, um, really, where you're going to be opening windows and doors. And Stephen and I both yeah. know we, <laughs> yeah. we, we do open the windows and doors in January and February at our house because it overheats sometimes when you have the windows unshaded. Um, so the, the, the exterior shading is... Um, is really critical to making some of these houses that are maybe a little more luxury oriented with larger glass work um, on the smaller homes with, you know, more like Habitat for Humanity passive house projects, you're going to see a lot less glazing. And so the impacts on those same days for overheating are also less mitigated. Um, so so it's not it's not as critical and you don't have to buy those expensive shading devices. Yeah, it, really it is something that we run into on, on a lot of our projects because a lot of our clients like, you know, the wall to ceiling glass, um, indoor, outdoor living. Um, I know my house that I just completed, you know, we were definitely overglazed on the south side. So you do run into, you know, needing more cooling or just being willing to open windows um, in those shoulder seasons. Mm hmm. I think a really good example of a passive house, recently certified passive house with overhangs is Greg Fisher's house in Fort Collins. And Greg did a presentation for us last year. He was part of our panel earlier this year. And I don't know, Michael or Shannon, if you can drop, I know that they've done a YouTube video for that project. That's another just different style, different approach, still certified passive house. And um you know, I know he yeah. did a lot of, there's a lot of sweat equity in that project for him as well. For yeah. Sure. And it's a nice design. And I think he's got, you know, a lot of his majority glass South. Um, I visit the house under construction. So that's where you can use the overhang effectively. And, um, and if you minimize the East West glazing, you're not going to overheat. So that's, that's another strategy too, is really, um, you know, and you'll see that in the model when you do the modeling, if you do a lot of modeling, mm -hmm. um, but that takes somebody's time or money. You know, we did it early on because, um, I guess we were young and 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 not very intelligent, and we spent a lot of time staring at Excel spreadsheets. But you do learn that way, like when you um, add more east and west glass, you see that overheating number go up. Um, and then when you live in it, you realize it's it's true that you need to be very very uh, conscious of it. And I I realize, and like we said in this presentation, you know, it is the front range. People want to see the mountains, so the temptation is there um, for sure. You just really have to be um, in a passive house really think that one through. Yeah. And I mean, I have, I have a project with a big Western facing glass window, Brian, you know, all about that window. Yeah. Yes. And we have uh, an, a grove of small trees just beyond that. So that for those low sun angles in the summertime, there are other shading devices that it does have a partial overhang, but when the sun gets low on the West side, there's nothing that that's going to really do for us. So there are other strategies as well. But yeah, trees too. Yeah. If you have vegetation or other buildings um, that, you know, that is, that is a viable shading method, you know, absolutely. Uh, next question is a basement, a plus for a passive house. It's not a plus or, or a minus. It's just, you know, we treat it similar as far as, you know, making sure that the concrete's not cold. So it's insulated either on the inside or outside. Uh, we showed a couple of those details. Um, although like Brian was mentioning, you know, some of that thought process is changing as, you know, you move into a more heating dominated uh, climate, then maybe, you know, not insulating that basement slab as much. Or and cooling, cooling dominated. Cooling yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
you know, leaving some of that slab, you know, more exposed to the earth to uh, get that free cooling um, is, is maybe going to become more of a thing, in which case the basement would potentially be beneficial um, on the cooling side. Yeah. And I think the pass file software um, takes there, there's like one little cell in the PHPP where you can add mass. And so it's, it's, you know, but having done architecture in Colorado for 20 years, I'll tell you thermal mass in Colorado means more than it does in Germany because with of, of that slide I showed with the massive solar resource, because um, when that sun comes out, you get a lot of energy into the house. And so in some sense, if you have a basement and some of the windows are in the basement and that, that, that energy can be stored in a concrete foundation. And then the insulation is on the outside of that foundation. It's under the structural slab. So in, in this foam is strong enough to support the whole building. I mean, I see a lot of that. Um, architects will still think that concrete has to touch the ground, but you can put concrete over, you know, foam glass. You can put it over mineral. In some cases you can put it over foam. You just have to look at the density and your, your bearing capacity, your soil. So you can make that thermal mass become a battery a free battery because you're buying the concrete anyway because you're underground for your house. So you're already buying it. And if you, but you, if you keep, if you can for soils conditions, keep that on the inside, it's a big free battery that stores a lot of heat that you just bought. So, um, so yeah, it can be a benefit in that case. I think the answer is, and you, it, I'm pulling from your presentation a little bit. It depends because no. traditionally we spend more energy in a normal house heating our house during the year than we do cooling our house. But if you're in a passive house with really well-oriented windows, that could flip, in which case then you are benefiting from subterranean sort of thermally uh, balanced basement conditions that have less sun exposure or heat exposure. So yeah. yes, there's no easy answer. This is an interesting question and I'll let you guys, I'm just gonna read it as it is here. Why would you go with passive house versus net zero, especially if net zero is cheaper? Mm -hmm. And I can clarify terms for the audience if you want me to, or I can let you take that. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, why don't you clarify the terms there? Okay, so in a net zero house, and I'm not sure who asked this question, so I don't know um, if this is a professional or a homeowner, but my expect my intuition is that we're misunderstanding how these two certifications or methodologies relate to each other passive house says i'm going to take this object this building and i'm going to make it run with very little energy net zero says i'm going to take this house and i'm going to balance whatever energy it needs offset that energy no matter what the number is if it needs a hundred dollars of energy or ten dollars of energy net zero is gonna balance it. When you pair passive house with net zero, you only have to balance $10 of energy. But if you're doing it without, then you're gonna to have to, you know, you're gonna have a lot more solar panels or a lot more geothermal or a lot more, you know, solar community solar credits or whatever to try to balance the math problem because that's really what, what net zero is doing. Yeah, I think that's that it's on the head um, because you know, I had I did another presentation with an architect years ago, and we were both presenting geothermal projects, but we were presenting a passive house geothermal project. And after the presentation, he said, How are you doing geothermal so cheap? And I, I just said, Well, my loads are really low. So they were doing a two by six net zero house, mm -hmm. and we were doing a house with 16 inch thick walls and R10 windows. And so for me, it was easy to do geothermal because we were doing, you know two or three wells, um, kind of like Stephen's house, you know, that he showed it's, it's a very, it's, it's the, almost the minimum size. We're always typically buying the smallest geothermal system that they offer. Um, and so, um, you know, you're really, you, you know, the a net zero passive house is going to be, have less renewables than a net zero conventional house by far. Um, yeah. you, know, uh, you know, we're talking, you know, anywhere between two X and an order of magnitude less. So, so yeah, the passive house is the, the easiest way in my mind to get to net zero. It's the pathway um, because, uh, you know, conservation first, um, you know, it's, it's the, it's the, as my friend Lance Wright uh, used to say, <laughs> the greenest energy is energy not used. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, it, you don't want to, you don't want to have a mechanical system that, you know, it, that takes a lot of energy to run, even if it's offset by renewables, 
those things break, but insulation doesn't break. I mean, it's, it's good. so it lasts forever. It's it's dumb. It just sits there. It, it doesn't move. Um, it doesn't wear out typically. So so it's the it's it's the best investment for the long term. Yeah, and we talked about that in our first event that we did this year about how the smart smartest technology is the the dumbest technology, the stuff that doesn't move, the stuff in the walls, the recycled newspaper insulation that has almost no chance of failure versus your solar panels or your battery or your whatever pump. Um, and Stephen, I think that's a really, I know this question floated at some point, but can you speak to how many square feet your house was and how many geothermal wells you used for it? Yeah, it's for, a, for reference. Yeah, it's just over 3000 square feet. Um, and the system's a three and a half ton uh, system. And we actually drilled uh, shallower wells here because of the mines underneath this area. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it ended up being four holes instead of two. Um, and I think they were in the ballpark of 150 to 180 feet each. I know so. Andy, I was talking with Andy at last year's Green Home Tour and they ran into a mine that they didn't know it was there when they were drilling geothermal wells in Louisville. So that's a problem I didn't expect to have. Yeah. <laughs> we have here. I know my a project I'm working on, um, our geothermal contractor, this this is our 12 inch double stud wall house. Um, we only needed four wells. It's a huge project. And he said typically he would have needed eight to 12 for a similar sized house in Denver meeting normal energy code. So, yeah. you know, it was like 20 to 30% of the normal number of wells we would have needed for our system. Yes. Yes. And that's, uh, I did see that comment come up in the questions, um, you know, that geothermal, they didn't realize that you could do that, but I think it's a combination of things. Like generally you're looking at air source heat pumps and passive house, but with the tax credit, that slide that Steven showed in his house, that's enabled a lot of our clients to basically kind of get back to that um, that mini split price point. And for the smaller, simpler passive houses, you probably can't get geo to work because they like the smallest heat pump you can get, I think for geo is like a three ton. So, so if, you, if you're a 2000 or a 1000 square foot passive house, you're absolutely probably looking at an air source, you know, solution. Um, but for the bigger houses um, with, you know, you, you have a higher capital expenditure in general, that's where geo starts to make more sense. So we, we didn't really talk about that very well in the presentation, but there's kind of a threshold size wise that you cross um, where it becomes viable. That's a really good point. And I'll just use this moment to plug. We're working with Mitsubishi on a heat pump webinar for the end of this month. It's not on our calendar yet, but it will be. And we're going to get into a ton of nitty gritty air source, geothermal heat pump conversations. So keep an eye on that. If that's something you want to know more about, we have a whole category about heat pumps later, so we'll keep moving through and then uh, see what we can get to. Um, how well do passive house homes perform from a cooling standpoint in the summer? I mean, if they're if they're well designed, and you know that really just comes down to the shading, um, like we were just talking about. Um, if things are well shaded, um, especially east west. Um, and those, you know, self-facing windows with a good overhang, then they perform really good. Um, you know, especially in this climate, you can open things up or you can use the ERV to night cool, um, where you bring in the uh, fresh air at night, cool the building, leave it closed up during the day. You're still getting fresh air ventilation during the day, um, but you don't have to, you know, open, open windows to get that fresh air. Um, so you can keep keep everything closed up and insulated and performs really well. How, and we've talked to, about some of this in terms of the cost of passive house certification in order to qualify for XL rebates. Another thing we're working on is a collaboration with XL specifically talking about the rebates. So another thing to keep your eye out for, but can you talk to in the language of HERS how does Passive House compare to a Boulder County HERS 20 project? Do you know? Um, that's that's tricky. I would say without PV, our projects are in the kind of 30, 
40 range, maybe something like that without before PB. I, I don't really know, but I know in, in all of our projects are like a negative 20, negative 30 Hertz rating mm -hmm. when you put the PV on it. So if you're doing the Boulder County thing, you know, Excel is going to limit you to just under 10 kilowatts of PV of, um, of grid tied PV. You can obviously do off grid PV that um, just goes to a battery bank or, um, you know, heats a hot water tank, for example. Um, but, uh, you know, at that limit, you know, we're all, we're seeing our numbers with the, but, you know, with Boulder County, you can offset, um, you know, the HERS rating includes PV. So, um, what I always hear, um, uh, um, Ron Flack saying is, uh, the, the pre PV HERS score is what he's impressed by. And so, um, cause it, they are two different things, right? One is conservation and one is generation. So, um, your, 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 uh, pure her score, or he calls it or something like that. You know, the pre PV, the pre renewable yeah, her score is just hers is natural, natural. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> um, okay. I want to move into insulation and I'm going to jump around this list a little bit. One of the things, well, two things that I'm hearing right now that I, and I get this from a lot of different contractors is one is cellulose easy to get. I don't think anything's easy to get right now. And two, how do you deal with issues of settlement with cellulose? What is your install sequence method? Well, yeah, yeah Steve and I talked to our insulation contractor today, and he said, um, he's like, you guys are the only people that actually buy cellulose from us. So, <laughs> so I think we can get, the, the good news is we, we've had trouble getting foam, mineral wool, um, everything, but no one has told us yet they can't get cellulose. Yeah. So if, if someone else has that experience, let us know. But um, um, yeah, I mean, it seems like it's pretty readily available, um, at least at this point. Um, but it does sound like it's um, out of use. What uh, I have seen, and I'll just say this because yeah. I, I live in both worlds. I live in high performance world and I live in normal performance world professionally, um, is I've had trade partner insulation trade partners that have seen cellulose fail because of settlement and now won't do it mm -hmm. and so they don't want to buy it because they don't want to take the risk yeah but yeah. that's the bigger problem yeah and and our like some of the contractors we we've used have been concerned with that and they always try to talk us out of it um and using fiberglass because it's lighter and, and maybe settles less um but what we found is if you get a good install, um, you know, we haven't seen much settling. Um, and we, we have gone back and, and looked at houses with IR cameras and things like that. Um, but you really, you really just need to pay attention, um, to the install and, you know, make them come back in, you know, and it really just takes kind of almost padding, padding the walls and the, and the ceilings just to find those, those loose spots because you can't, um, you can't really see it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And we, and we've had, I mean, to be honest, we've had issues in, with installs for sure. We've seen some settling and we've learned, I don't know if we've totally learned from our mistakes, but in general, we've learned from our mistakes, like any, you know, if you have a lot of wiring that kind of runs or piping that kind of runs through a certain area, sometimes it can create like a little gap or whatever. And, um, so some of the, this is, this is really diving into the weeds to some degree, but yes, um, you have to kind of know what you're doing. And again, the simple design, you know, keeping most of your services out of like wall cavities or not having a bunch of weird beams from the porch connecting in or something. It's always these weird spaces, um, that are not, they're non-typical that end up causing problems. So, um, but yes, it's a real thing. Um, and it's an installation quality is just like air sealing quality. You know, you just because you put a piece of tape on the wall doesn't mean it's going to stick and doesn't mean it doesn't have holes in it or gaps or something. So so you got to use the IR camera, like Stephen was saying, you got to watch your installer install it, make sure they're really um, doing a good job and watch out for your your HVAC and, and other trades that might put something in the wall or yeah, if you have those tricky areas, you just need to pay attention to them and, and, and basically have them, you know, focus on those areas as they're filling um, to make sure they get around all those pipes and wires. And I think that just goes back to finding the right trade group for your project, because I don't want, if my installation trade partner doesn't want to install cellulose because he's like, I haven't done it well, 
I really don't want you to do it on my project either. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sounds great. But either yeah. I need yeah. to work with him within his his skill sets and his yeah. comfort zone, what he's perfected, or I need to find a different partner to do that yes. with. Yes. I can't remember who it was, but one person only did cellulose. I can't remember who this was like years ago, but, and they were really into it and they really were meticulous and we don't use them anymore because I don't think they exist or maybe they're, but um, yes, you have to find the person who's, ex, who's like, I can do I this. Can do it. And I've talked yeah. to Enrico at Emu about, you know, how do we verify the R value we're getting? How do we verify the density? And he's talked about actually like basically coring out the cellulose from a cup and weighing it to get it like an idea of exactly how dense packed it is and make sure you're getting what you've asked for. But I think it's another really um, piece. Yeah. And on that, you know, if you, if you were really meticulous and um, I did this at my most recent job, but I just kind of verified the bags that we were buying and the bags they actually put in the building. And, and you know, maybe one cavity wasn't as dense as another one, but essentially we used all the bags we thought we were going to use. And I, you know, then it, you know, you're in the right, it's in there somewhere and you might not have the perfect density everywhere, but you probably have close to the right density. Most places. Yeah. Um, can you talk about the type of fire retardant chemical that's added to cellulose insulation versus yeah. like a wool blend? Yeah. So it's boric acid. It's, it's pretty benign is my understanding. Um, and I know we've had clients who are really particular about insulation and we have done the wool bats on the inside um, for those particular clients. And then we typically do like a wood eye joist wall or an exterior insulated wall where we tell them, hey, the wool insulation that is you're touching um, or the recycled cotton bats, maybe in some cases or whatever, so whatever you feel comfortable with, that's what's on the inside that you're, you know, is in, inside your, your um, space. And then the cellulose or the, the foam or the mineral wool, or the fiberglass, that's all on the outside of the building. Um, I guess the other way to look at this is what Stephen was talking about earlier when we were talking about the upgrades um, for the double stud wall assembly. And I think, you know, um, what you'll see on like, for example, 475's website or with their Intello product um, or uh, EMU system is you're creating a service cavity where you actually have a membrane that keeps all of that, whatever it is, in the envelope. And then your wires and your, your finish uh, drywall is in this, uh, there's a service cavity between you and that material. Uh, mm -hmm. So if, if that makes some people more comfortable, I think it's worth paying for that upgrade. Um, that's another reason to buy that upgrade is that that peace of mind if or if you have a chemical sensitivity or um, you're worried about that. I mean, we're we we're trying to present tonight like, look, I want to get this thirty seven thousand. What's the cheapest way to get there? And that's kind of why we we did it the way we did it, because um, it's like, hey, tape the plywood and fill it with cellulose. Yeah. <laughs> Understood mm -hmm. um, and agreed. Um. So we had our, our last event was about firewise construction with Andrew Mitchler. And we talked a lot in that event about how there's a lot of overlap between kind of uh, firewise construction in terms of air sealing and, you know, we're not doing vented crawl spaces and whatever, um, you know, triple pane windows. Um, but there are also details and Brian, you and I have talked about this details standard building science details that are in conflict with fire resiliency and that can go either way with passive house like you know we've talked about rain screens for one yeah. um can you just talk about briefly how you think maybe we need to start approaching these details differently than we have in the past or how we approach passive house and firewise details in conjunction with each other um without forgetting about moisture problems and everything else yeah, this is a really, um, it's a personal one for me because we did, um, you know, the house we lost that burned in the fire had a wood rain screen. It was a vented rain screen. It had a fiberboard cladding. And then underneath that fiberboard cladding was our straw bale wall. And that straw bale wall, you know, there was a fire testing done. That was a one hour wall. That was um, two inches of earth plaster, both sides of the straw bale. And that our house did was standing for six hours burning. So it didn't just like fall down in five minutes. It was- crazy because you were right in that initial right. path right yeah. in the beginning of the fire. right in the beginning right in the beginning and one of our neighbors who didn't um the, i won't say which neighbor but the sheriff had to kick him out a couple of times he kept coming in to look at what was going on um from the periphery 
And um, he said, yeah, you know, it just, it simmered basically our house simmered, but the wood rain screen was a weak point. And the, when, when we first started passive house, I think we were very cognizant of what they were saying about moisture safe detailing and venting to the outside. So our house was so thick of walls. We had that open rain screen, we had wood fiber, for breathability, but that was a, a liability um, in the fire. So in the future, and what I think uh, Boulder County is adopting is we're going to probably have some sort of non-combustible skin. We're going to have a non-combustible cladding. And then behind that, if we feel like we need to vent it, we're going to have a screen assembly with a fine, you know, stainless mesh that's not going to let embers get into it, that we're venting behind that. But it's not going to be this beautiful low carbon rain screen that we had that was rough sawn wood that came out of Granby. Um, because yeah, I'm paranoid now, and um, and the rules have changed. You know, we're we're, we're looking at uh, firewise construction, uh, ignition resistant construction by Boulder County standards, east of Broadway now. So, mm -hmm. um, so my perspective has changed, and also I think Stephen and I, we've had experience with double stud walls now, and I think in this climate and that building science article we ref referenced was in Massachusetts. Was that 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 actual study? It was a 12 inch stud wall. Um, that, you know, they didn't detect any real problems with, even though in Woofy, it was a little sketchy. And even the moisture sensors were saying, hey, it's sketchy. But in our Colorado dry climate, we feel pretty safe that you could do, you know, that wall assembly without any kind of venting um, and be OK in, in this with an airtight, with a passive house, a certified passive house airtight assembly, you know, meeting the, the airtightness requirements that that's a safe wall to build from a moisture standpoint and a firewise standpoint. Same thing goes for the roof. If you got to vent the roof, you know, you, you can use a real fine mesh and meet those requirements, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's different or use mineral wool for your, your over insulation and, mm -hmm. and don't, don't vent it, you right. know, but yeah, we're not, we're not going to vent. And I think really what this comes back to, I've talked to um, some building science consultants about this, in, this, detail in particular being rain screens and um, also soffit venting is, you know, what is your greater risk in your acute situation? And that changes in within Boulder County, it changes within the front range. Is moisture your bigger concern based on the design you've created? It's, you know, access to water. It's, you know, is it on the north side sitting over a flat roof within a few feet or is it on the south side? and getting lots of daylight and high off the ground you know so is your risk water is your risk fire and the answer might change yeah. depending on what that situation is and how you design it yeah. but yeah. i think we are definitely learning a lot and our details are all changing um, based on these experiences um let's see they're adding questions as i go this is we're, we can be here all day um so thinking about indoor air quality and health, switching topics, do you recommend, and this is, this is interesting, so I'm interested in your, I haven't thought about this before, do you recommend clients keep the house more leaky, quote unquote, as much as possible, like opening windows in the first year to minimize VOC inhalation? Every new building will have an, an initial decay curve. Um, and not all items can be specified on low VOC, like certain appliances, wiring, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, an interesting question. I mean, you know, the one added benefit of, you know, passive house with the uh, separate ventilation system is that it is changing out your indoor air every three to four hours. Um, so you are, you know, exhausting those VOCs um, during that period, uh, even without opening the windows. And then, mm -hmm. you know, of course, you know, after you finish wood floors, you know, or, you know, venting the house for, you know, a week or so is, is always a good idea um, just to get that initial. Um, and in reality, your ERV system is constantly exchanging air forever. And yeah. so you're gonna reduce that decay curve or you're gonna accelerate that curve as we actively filter and exchange air in that building without ever opening it, because we're controlling that intentionally with these mechanical systems. Yeah, and, and even in the case you have your windows closed, you're never gonna get a buildup of VOCs because of that you know, constant air change, so yeah. Mm -hmm. And actually one of the questions we got was how many air exchanges per hour are you working at? 
so yeah, it's like basically what Steven said, you know, it's like, we always tell people it's roughly, you know, um, every three hours you're getting kind of brand new air, mm -hmm. but there's the passive house standard, which is a little different from like the ashray standard. And, and then there's what I call like, uh, I don't know the, the, you know, the client ventilation rate, which is when, once you move in, some people want to overventilate their house. And to be honest, I ran my ventilation higher or on boost a lot of the time when I maybe didn't have to, but I just, you know, we just did it. Um, so, so you have some control of the thing you're going to commission it, but then you also have some control to increase the ventilation rate. And we typically oversize that unit a little bit because the cost of upgrading the size of the ventilation unit um, is not very much, but then you have this extra capacity for parties or for, if you, you know, burn the toast or something, um, you know, that kind of thing where you can, you can overventilate the house, but um, so typically we'd always specify the, the slightly larger unit. And then, yeah, you could run it. You could do something where you ran it high for the first six months while you're in the house and there's an energy penalty. But, you know, if you wanted to measure your indoor quality VOCs, well, you could and, and just wait until that, that curve kind of um, dies down. Because it's, it's true. You buy new clothes, you buy new shoes, you buy new, you know, whatever. Rugs. And rugs. Rates. It's yeah. something. Is, yeah. Something yeah. is going to Yeah, something yeah. is going to have it. Yeah. And if you're, especially if you're sensitive to that, but what's nice is that in these homes, whether it's a certified passive house or something in that, you know, pathway, you have a lot more control over clean air exchange filtered air than you would in a traditional construction. Yes. Um, can you speak up wondering what options you recommend for kitchen ventilation in passive houses to deal with odors and vaporized fats, particularly above the cooktop? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I put this one in the category of um, condensing dryers also. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we, we did our first round of passive houses and everyone's like, these dryers don't actually dry your clothes. And like this hood doesn't actually exhaust your stuff. So um, my preference now is to like the best thing you can do for your dryer is put it in a non-conditioned attached space. Like, for example, a mudroom between your attached garage and house where you're not heating that space but you can direct vent that dryer and you don't have to buy. And I think the heat pump dryers are better, but my point is like some of the stuff in passive house ends up being stuff that is the user is it's not making the user happy. Um, I think, you know, Amory Lovin said all people really want is a hot shower and a cold beer or something like that. And that, you know, it's like, it's true. We're, the whole point of passive house is comfort and user friendliness. So if your, your dryer doesn't dry your clothes or you feel like you're not getting adequate exhaust ventilation, there's an energy penalty to, to that. But I think that's worth, it's worth paying for the health concerns in that, in that thing. And that's something that the standard needs to accept in the long term. I think is that, you know, yes, energy is a priority, but it's not the only priority. The, the real priority is taking care of human beings. That's why we build shelters. And so that's got to come first, um, uh, even though, yes, some houses we recirc over the induction cooktop and we don't provide exhaust air, but, you know, the ERB is going to clear that out and you can boost your ERB when you're cooking or you can open windows um, or you can exhaust from your hood and if you feel more comfortable. And we've done all those things, just depending on the client. Yeah, I know that I, I've seen certified passive houses that have dedicated hoods for their kitchen, for their cooktop that exhaust out. And it's one of the only sort of exhaust points um, outside of the, the mechanical system. And there's makeup air specifically for that. And that helps just accelerate clean air in the house. And so I think you can balance that. And again, that's where we're, we're getting into nitty gritty details and you have to look at it holistically and understand what your priorities are and your preferences are in the project. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, yeah, when I first got into Pass House, I think, you you know, I kind of swallowed the, the pill. I took the red pill or whatever it is, and and we went all in, you know. Yeah. But then after doing it for a couple of years and you get frustrated clients that are like, you know, I want it like this. And you're like, yeah, OK, it, you know, it's not about saving the last lot, you know, um, it's it's really about creature comfort and, that, you know, um, and, and, and health and, 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 and um, you know. I think for me, what really sells me on on the passive house pathways, you get resiliency. Again, you're talking about extreme weather events in California, pg e the energy company in California turns off power on red flag days constantly. And my grandmother lives out there and she's older and it's 
110 degrees outside and they've turned off her power. And I'm like, not worried about my food going bad. I'm worried about my grandmother being yeah, safe yeah. in her home. Yes. And so in a passive house or in a highly insulated, high-performing home, your the temperature is going to stay consistent longer, stay cool or warm longer during those events. Thinking about Texas last year, yeah. our own outages during the Marshall fire, I had people evacuate to my house one because they were evacuated for the fire and one because they didn't have power and it was like 10 degrees outside, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's one level of resiliency. The other being clean air, comfort, no draftiness, the quiet, like those to me are all the creature comforts that come with passive house. And then there's again, that like, if you want to get to net zero energy, if you want to have solar, if you want to be off grid, if you want to be more independent, it's a lot easier to balance that math problem if you're if you don't need that much energy to run your house. Um, do passive homes protect against radon, or do other radon mitigation techniques need to be employed? Um, yes, and yes, and yes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It just depends on how severe the radon is. Typically, the air sealing, if you you know, get a good vapor barrier underneath the slab. We've had houses that <laughs> had high rate on before, but didn't test uh, high after. Um, but we have uh, had houses as well that um, tested high enough to require uh, a separate rate on ventilation system. Yeah, I mean, we're always going to put one in. Um, but yeah, I mean, the whole point of that sub slab, if you do a good job, is easy. you're going to get most of it. So that it, you know. Because your sub slab mitigation system is still just a mitigation system. It's not a solution hundred percent. So, so when you're sealing your foundation, absolutely take it seriously because that is your vapor um, moisture radon barrier. And that's, um, you know, if you leak a little air to the outside out of your roof, maybe that's not the worst place um, or your window leaks, maybe a little bit in the corner or something, but you know, under the slab, that's a, that's a place to really spend your time and do it right. Cause, cause, because of the radon, because of that risk. Yeah, I'm looking to see, we're just, just gonna do one or two more and then I think we're gonna call it cause we're well past our time here. Um, Bonnie asked about, has anyone gotten to the point of getting the rebate from Excel? Those rebates are brand new and will be issued when projects are done. So nobody has cashed in on those rebates yet, but I think Excel's good for it. They're really dedicated to this. I've been in conversations with them and um, I'm excited to see more systems like this that help offset the cost of super high performance homes. I'm just gonna get that one out of the way to make sure that's clear for everybody. Um, one of the questions, and this kind of speaks to things CGBG does typically end of summer. Are there any passive homes in Rock Creek or can we get a passive house through Rock Creek HOA. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, Passive House doesn't have any specific design requirements. So you can kind of achieve any uh, aesthetic, you know, that the HOA would find, you know, fitting to the existing neighborhood and then create, a, you know, a Passive House. Yeah, I, I would say in most cases you could do it but you could, you could say the HOA might cost you more money by making it look a different way that actually is working against you from a cost optimized passive house. Yeah. And that's why the examples we showed tonight were all like, I think, um, you know, very, very smart, very intentional, well thought out, cost effective passive house examples. And so when you start getting an HOAs where they're like, well, we want you to put, you know, two feet of stone on the whole front of your house. Well, that just, that's, that does not doing anything for, and it costs it, it, energy efficiency or anything. It's just that that is an added cost. And if they say, we want you to add dormers to your front roof, you know, it's gotta be this like two dormers in your gable or something, then that's just added cost and complexity and, um, you know, potential thermal bridging. So, so unfortunately I think, and I hope maybe someone who's on the board of an HOA is watching and they're like, no, we're going to be lenient where we understand what's at stake here. And um, yeah, I think, you know, even in a traditional neighborhood, you can make a house more traditional looking with some simple tricks, 
you know, covered front porch with columns and make that the design feature. You can do a gable, maybe even do a faux, you know, gable dormer or something if you need to. That's a, it's a superficial tacton thing. It's not an envelope thing. Um, but certainly there's, this is the kind of thing we need to work on because I, I, I have a HOA project we're designing right now. And yes, it is costing more money to do Passive House because of these sorts of things. And I, I am just going to take my own position and say that we need to rethink how HOAs have operated because we've learned that a lot of what HOAs want, increase price, increase risk, and are counterproductive in terms of firewise. And a lot of them are just very outdated. Um, I know there's also a number of covenants that people didn't realize were even still there that are impacting design limitations in martial fire jurisdictions. And I don't know what the process is for this. We talked about this at an AIA event last week, but um, I think it's time for us as architects and building professionals to question those things. Like, are these, should we still be requiring these things knowing what we know now? Because we didn't know this stuff when these guidelines were written and it's incumbent on the boards of these HOAs to, to take this seriously because they're creating all these guidelines for homeowners, whether they like it or not. So we're gonna do two quick questions. One, and Stephen, you touched on this earlier. Do you know of any tax rebates or incentives for building a passive house in Boulder County if you were not in the Marshall Fire Zone? And I know we have solar geothermal tax credits federally still on the table, which will hopefully get re-upped. Did you do an Excel? Yeah. I, those are the only ones that I took advantage of, was the, the PV, yeah, the federal PV and the geothermal. And I believe there are some Energy Star other rebates out there, but I'm, I'm not sure. The rebates I've seen otherwise are not nearly as substantial as what we're looking at with Excel yeah, right no, now. They're, so. they're, they're, yeah, closer to like under $1,000. Or... Mm -hmm. um, and then the last thing we're going to speak to right now, and um, Bonnie's been at a lot of our events. And Bonnie, I really thank you just because you've always asked really great questions. She pointed out um, that she's 92 and looking for a universally accessible home and obviously passionate because I've seen you in these events month after month. So thank you for being here. Um, her point is we need to see and walk through real examples. Can that be done locally or at another location where we get bused to or flown to projects? And I'd love to know your thoughts on what we can do. I'll kind of speak to what maybe CGBG can work on to help people visualize these kinds of homes. Yeah, I know there's the, you know, there's the the home tour that they, I don't think it's happened maybe in the last year or so. Yeah, last but, year. And we oh, walked, we, Andy Johnson's project in Louisville was a part of that, which oh, is, okay. um, do you want to be on the home tour, Stephen? Can I just throw you on the spot right now? <laughs> we can talk about it for sure. <laughs> we can talk about it. Um, so for anybody watching right now that doesn't know about the home tour, typically we host the home tour at the end of September and we look at um, homes of all different sizes and, you know, budgets and typologies that are different levels of green or, or high performance. I know right now I'm looking for projects that are more relatable, especially for those in the Marshall Fire community. So Stephen, I'm going to, I'm really going to bother you about this now. Yeah. You're, on, you're on the hook, but, um, we will be looking for other projects towards the end of summer. In the meantime, um, one of the things our board has talked about is looking for other videos of local, regional, national passive house projects that are, that do tours, that do virtual tours. And, you know, it's a lot to ask of somebody to come into their home and interrupt their life and walk through their spaces. And um, we know that, which is why, you know, we only have, a, we only do a couple of homes on the home tour. It's educational. It's, um, great, but also, especially with the level of interest, we're going to lean on these virtual tours as well to get people in homes and visualizing them sooner. Because I know a lot of people are making decisions right now. So we'll work on that on our end and try to add, add some videos to our website. So look back, Bonnie. We'll try to send it out in a newsletter. Okay, at that, any final thoughts? 
Brian, Stephen, anything I missed that you really want to talk about? There's a lot of questions left here, and we'll see if there's things we can address on a blog later, but it's 8.30, so we're going to wrap it wrap it up. Yeah, we'd be happy to look at the, I mean, we, we couldn't keep up in the chat, but we could answer some of those questions and just do like a written PDF or something and, and yeah. try to put it and maybe we could speak more intelligently about some of them, you know, if we're, if we're babbling or I know we had some audio issues with our presentation. So, so, but it may be, and that's a PDF that could exist. You know, um, we also wanted to kind of do, I think, a resources, our own resources page that was just a link to things that we, uh, suppliers and things that, so people could have the resources, um, uh, you know, that we've used to get a lot of these things we've talked about. Yeah, that'd be great. We can do um, a follow-up blog just to get that on our page and we'll direct them to yeah. whatever you post. And um, we've got a document of all the questions that were asked today. So we will we'll share that with you guys and try to share that information. Thank you everybody for participating and being here tonight. I know we had over 200 people on this call tonight and that's, I know your time is valuable. And so we're Great. grateful and thanks to everybody. Yeah, thanks thanks for thank you. We hope it helps. Yes, it does. <laughs> thank you guys. We really appreciate it.